Welcome to our reading number five of The Hobbit, written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Here's a quick recap of what we've learned so far. At a gathering at the house of Bilbo the Hobbit, Thorin, the great dwarf, told stories of his ancestors and how at one time they had great wealth stored away deep in mountains. Then terrible dragons ruined their world, taking over their great piles of gold and jewels. Thorin also spoke about his ancestors who had been killed by evil forces, including Azog the Goblin and the Necromancer. It was now time to go back and recover their gold and bring peace to their lands, and Bilbo the Burglar was an important part of their plans, but he was still a little nervous about joining them on their quest. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy Hughes over at ARC's Youth Connection in Mount Kisco, who will read us session number five of The Hobbit. Chapter two, Roast Mutton. Up jumped Bilbo, and putting on his dressing gown, went into the dining room. There he saw nobody, but all the signs of large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the room and piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seemed to have been used. The washing up was so dismally real that Bilbo was forced to believe the party of the night before had not been part of his bad dreams, as he had rather hoped. Indeed, he was really relieved after all to think that they had all gone without him and without bothering to wake him up, but with never a thank you, he thought. And yet, in a way, he could not help feeling just a trifle disappointed the feeling surprised him don't be a fool bilbo baggins he said to himself thinking of dragons and all that outlandish nonsense at your age so he put on an apron lit fires boiled water and washed up then he had a nice little breakfast in the kitchen before turning out the dining room by that time the sun was shining and the front door was open letting in a warm spring breeze Bilbo began to whistle loudly and to forget about the night before. In fact, he was just sitting down to a nice little second breakfast in the dining room by the open window when in walked Gandalf. My dear fellow, said he, whenever are you going to come? What about an early start? And here you are having breakfast, or whatever you call it, at half past ten. They left you the message because they could not wait. What message said poor mr baggins all in a fluster great elephants said gandalf you are not at all yourself this morning you have never dusted the mantelpiece what's that got to do with it i i have had enough to do with washing up for fourteen the mantelpiece you would have found this just under the clock said gandalf handing bilbo a note written of course on his own note paper this is what it read thorin and company to burglar bilbo greeting for your hospitality our sincerest thanks and for your offer of professional assistance our grateful acceptance terms cash on delivery up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits if any all traveling expenses guaranteed in any event funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives if occasion rises that the matter is not otherwise arranged for thinking it unnecessary to disturb your esteemed repose we have proceeded in advance to make requisite preparations and shall await your respected person at the green dragon inn by water at 11 a.m sharp trusting that you will be punctual we have the honor to remain yours deeply Thorin and company. That leaves you just 10 minutes. You will have to run, said Gandalf. But, said Bilbo, no time for it, said the wizard. But, said Bilbo again, no time for that either. Off you go. To the end of his days, Bilbo could never remember how he found himself outside without a hat, a walking stick, or any money, or anything that he usually took when he went out. Leaving his second breakfast half finished and quite unwashed up, pushing his keys into Gandalf's hands, and running as fast as his furry feet could carry him down the lane, past the great mill, across the water, and then on for a mile or more. Very puffed he was when he got to Bywater, just on the stroke of eleven, and found he had come without a pocket handkerchief. Bravo, said Balin, who was standing at the inn door, looking out for him. And just then, all the others came around the corner of the road from the village. They were on ponies and each pony was slung about with all kinds of baggages, packages, parcels, 
and paraphernalia. There was a very small pony, apparently, for Bilbo. Up you two get and off we go, said Thorin. I'm awfully sorry, said Bilbo, but I have come without my hat, and I have left my pocket handkerchief behind, and I haven't got any money. I didn't get your note until after 1045, to be precise. Don't be precise, said Dwalin, and don't worry, you will have to manage without pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before you get to the journey's end. As for a hat, I have got a spare hood and cloak in my luggage. That's how they all came to start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning just before May on laden ponies, and Bilbo was wearing a dark green hood, a little weathered stained, and a dark green cloak borrowed from Dwalin. They were too large for him, and he looked rather comic. What his father Bungo would have thought of him, I daren't think. His only comfort was he couldn't be mistaken for a dwarf, as he had no beard. They had not been riding very long when up came Gandalf, very splendid, on a white horse. He had brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs and Bilbo's pipe and tobacco. So after that, the party went along very merrily, and they told stories or sang songs as they rode forward all day, except, of course, when they stopped for meals. These didn't come quite as often as Bilbo would have liked them, but still he began to feel that adventures were not so bad after all. At first they had passed through Hobbit lands, a wide, respectable country inhabited by decent folk, with good roads, an inn or two, and now and then a dwarf or a farmer ambling by on business. When they came to lands where people spoke strangely and sang songs Bilbo had never heard before, now they had gone on far into the lone lands where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grew steadily worse. Not far ahead were dreary hills, rising higher and higher, dark with trees. On some of them were old castles with an evil look, as if they had been built by wicked people. Everything seemed gloomy, for the weather that day had taken a nasty turn. Mostly it had been as good as May can be, even in merry tales. But now it was cold and wet. In the lone lands, they had been obliged to camp when they could, but at least it had been dry. To think it will soon be June, grumbled Bilbo, as he splashed along behind the others in a very muddy track. It was after tea time. It was pouring with rain and had been all day. His hood was dripping into his eyes. His cloak was full of water, and the pony was tired and stumbled on stones. The others were too grumpy to talk. And I'm sure the rain has got into the dry clothes and into the food bags, thought Bilbo. Bother burgling and everything to do with it. I wish I was at home in my nice hole by the fire with the kettle just beginning to sing. It was not the last time that he wished that. Still, the dwarves jogged on, never turning around or taking any notice of the hobbit. Somewhere behind the gray clouds, the sun must have gone down, for it began to get dark as they went down into a deep valley with a river at the bottom. Wind got up and willows along its bank bent and sighed. Fortunately, the road went over an ancient stone bridge, for the river, swollen with the rains, came rushing down from the hills and mountains in the north. It was nearly night when they had crossed over. The wind broke up the gray clouds, and a wandering moon appeared above the hills between the flying rags. Then they stopped, and Thorin muttered something about supper. And where shall we get a dry patch to sleep on? Not until then did they notice that Gandalf was missing. So far, he had come all the way with them, never seeing if he was in the adventure or merely keeping them company for a while. He had eaten most, talked most, and laughed most, but now he simply was not there at all. Just when a wizard would have been most useful, too, groaned Dory and Nori, who shared the hobbit's views about regular meals and plenty and often. They decided in the end that they would have to camp where they were. They moved to a clump of trees, and though it was drier under them, the wind shook the rain off the leaves, and the drip-drip was most annoying. Also, the mistress seemed to have gotten into the fire. Dwarves can make a fire almost anywhere, out of almost anything, wind or no wind, but they could not do it that night. Not even Owen and Glowen, who were especially good at it. Then one of the ponies took fright at nothing and bolted. He got into the river before they could catch him and before they could get him out again. Pilly and Killy were nearly drowned, and all the baggage that he carried was washed away off him. Of course, it was mostly food, and there was mighty little left for supper and less for breakfast. There they all sat, glum and wet 
and muttering, while Owen and Glowen went on trying to light the fire and quarreling about it. Bilbo was sadly reflecting that adventures were not all pony rides in May sunshine, when Balin, who was always there, lookout man, said, There's a light over there. There was a hill some way off with trees on it, pretty thick in parts. Out of the dark mass of the trees, they could now see a light shining, a reddish, comfortable-looking light, as it might be a fire or, or torches twinkling. When they had looked at it for some while, they fell to arguing. Some said no, and some said yes. Some said they could go and see, and anything was better than little supper, less breakfast, and wet clothes all night. Others said, these parts are none too well known and are too near the mountains. Travelers seldom come this way now. The old maps are no use. Things have changed for the worse, and the road is unguarded. They have seldom even heard of the king round here, and the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less trouble you are likely to find, some said. After all, there are fourteen of us, others said. Where has Gandalf got to? This remark was repeated by everybody. Then the rain began to pour down worse than ever, and Owen and Glowen began to fight. That settled it. After all, we have got a burglar with us, they said. And so they made off, leading their ponies, with all due and proper caution, in the direction of the light. They came to the hill and were soon in the wood. Up the hill they went, but there was no proper path to be seen, such as might lead to a house or a farm. And do what they could, they made a deal of rustling and crackling and creaking, and a good deal of rumbling and dratting, as they went through the trees in the pitch dark. Thank you, Kathy, for that great reading. And we'll see you all at our next session, session number six. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.